Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another installment of the Can We Please Talk podcast. As always, I'm Mike Leon. And I'm Nick Saveri. I've learned very quickly during my brief time in the science world, where I am way too often one of the only people of my gender in the room, that misogynistic annoyances abound. And not every instance of insanity requires that I fly off the handle or preach the merits of gender equality. Sometimes you just got to pause and breathe until the stupid stops. So that voice you just heard uh, is Erin Mallon. She's going to be our guest for tonight as we're going to explore the world of voice narration. Um, Erin is a voice narrator and has narrated over 500 books out there in the space. Uh, You can check out her books on uh, audible.com. She's also written uh, her newest book, which is called Flirtosaurus. And we're going to get into the topic really tonight of how she got into this career, because it's so fascinating that she's been in plays as an actor uh, and she's written plays. Um, some have been off Broadway. Uh, and now she's moved over in this career transition into voice narration, which is insanely fascinating for people that don't even know how to get into the field of voice narration. So she's going to let us in on that. But then recently now she has combined both worlds and written and narrated her own book, Florida Source, like I mentioned, which is available now wherever books are sold and, and on Audible. And Nick, um, it's pretty, pretty interesting to, to talk with, with Aaron tonight. I'm pretty excited to to just kind of learn a little bit about this. You know, I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with Audible books, but I know that they have uh, taken off in recent years. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to hear how she got into all of this. Yeah, Aaron's is a fascinating story. Uh, I do listen to audiobooks uh, just you know when I was you know, on the road during you know prior to COVID. Uh, even now. Um, I still just enjoy sometimes just having just a story sort of, you know, read to read and read in my ear, honestly, um, just adds a different layer to what, what I can sometimes read with my eyes. Uh, but Aaron just brings that amazing voice to the quality of her work, but also, um, just a, an amazing story as to how she got to this place she is now. And today we get a chance to hear about that journey. So it's going to be exciting. All right, joining us now, she's an award-winning narrator of over 500 books, um, and her latest one is available on Audible and wherever books are sold. It's called Flirtosaurus, and that is Erin Mallon. Erin, Mike Leon, Nick Saveri, uh, thanks for joining us today. Hey, how's it going? It's really good. Um, we really ha- appreciate having you on. Um, you have such an interesting story and in what you do, uh, voice narration, writing. Tell our audience a little bit of, about yourself and, and how you got started in, in doing all of this. Sure. Um, so I come from the theater and uh, I was in my first play when I was 15 and I was a dancer at the time. Um, so I did a lot of plays. I was in the chorus. And then when they first let me start talking, I was like, oh, that's what I like even better than the dancing. Um, and, uh, so I did a ton of plays, went to college for, for theater. Um, and it wasn't until I got out of school, out of college that I started writing, um, which now is funny to me. Um, So after a bunch of years of being in New York and being in a ton of downtown theater, which people tend to call like, it tends to be more experimental new plays that I was performing in on stage. um, I started writing plays and never in a million years did I think that that would be anywhere near as pleasurable as being on stage, but um, it kind of started to surpass it. Um, so writing plays and, um, when I got into narration for audiobooks, that took over my performance energy that made sure that every day I was in the booth playing, you know, sometimes up to 80 characters in one book. So I was acting every day and writing plays. And so that's what I focus on now, writing and narrating. When you think of key moments just in your career trajectory what what one stand out that got you from you know acting at 15 years old to here I guess I, I would come at it from two ways because we can talk about writing and we can talk about narration which they're the same world if I, books but um you come at them differently so uh I did a lot of tv commercials as a voice artist and I loved the process of being in the recording booth and the fact that I love being on stage so much I thought I would love books. If I could 
because a 10-hour a book is like a 10-hour monologue where you get to play everyone, um, whether I'm suitable for it not f- or not physically, it doesn't matter when you're in audio. Um, so the first time I narrated a book, I was like, yeah, I would love to get really good at this. Um, my first book I narrated was in 2010. Um, and it took me a while. It took me a couple of years to start building a career and to have the skills where people consistently hired me. And then I think in like 2014, I was able to quit other work and just focus on that. But when it comes to writing, um, my first play that was done, it was off, off Broadway. Um, I remember sitting in the back. It was a, it was a comedy, probably call it a dark comedy. Um, I remember sitting in the very back of the theater and watching the audience watch the play. And it was thrilling to watch them watch it. And they didn't know I was the writer. They didn't know who I was. They didn't care. Um, But the joy that I got watching them enjoy themselves was so thrilling. I was like, I got to keep doing this. You know, Aaron, um, because you do such a specialized uh, thing in terms of writing and narrating your own books, and and you've done plays before, as you mentioned, um, who were some of your sources of inspiration? Because, you know, I know audio books has kind of exploded in in recent years, but who who was somebody that you looked at in in the profession or was it in writing and theater that that was kind of your inspirations? Uh, Again, it's funny. They're, they're really different worlds really different worlds, um, narrating books and being in the theater. So it's interesting because now, particularly during COVID when theaters have been closed, I've been taking my plays and I've been adapting them for audio. And that's been a wild process to bring those two worlds together where the people that know me as a narrator and as a new author are willing to take um, it's not a risk, I suppose, but they're willing to try out um, an audio play. And one of the reviews was someone saying, I never thought I'd be much for audio plays, but then Erin Mallon said, hold my beer. <laughs> and she's like, she really is into them now because she, she had someone she knew and trusted to like guide her into that world. Um, so I'm, I am blending the worlds, but they do tend to be quite um, different and separate. So in terms of um, audio books, um, there's a wonderful uh, narrator who's passed, sadly, her name's Catherine Kelgren, and she's incredible. Um, I'm so glad that even though she's no longer here, her work is here and people can still hear her. She's, Catherine Kelgren's amazing. I used to listen to her a lot. I'm like, if I could be half as good as she is at storytelling and dialect work, um, then I'd be psyched. So she was an inspiration for sure for um, narration. When it comes to playwriting, basically everyone that I worked with as when I was an actor in their plays, because I used to sit in rooms with the playwright and the director and the other actors and watch them and listen to them as we tried to figure out what the play wanted to be, how we could make this play the best play it could be for the audience. And I knew it was a turning point when I wasn't waking up in the morning thinking about what play am I going to be in? I was thinking about their conversations and that dance that they did between the director and the playwright. I wanted to be the, in the playwright seat. Um, and that really took me by surprise. But once I got over that feel, like I used to, this is funny, back in the day, if an if a actor turned into a playwright, I used to think, oh, that's sad, they're not acting. I thought that they were, that not that it was a failure by any means, but oh, they must be upset. And then it happened to me and I'm like, no, they're not upset, they're psyched. <laughs> acting is amazing and wonderful. But when, um, for particular people, you're, you're meant to do something slightly different and um, surprised me, but I love being in the writer seat, I really do. Are there, any particular, are there any particular books or authors' voices that you'd like to take on in future projects? Um, it's, this has been a fun night. I, um, I had a, another interview right before this. Um, there's something called the Erin Knight Book Club right now, which is really funny. Um, these lovely people that listen to books that I narrate. And so every month they choose a different book and they listen to it. And then they have a, 
a Zoom call and I pop in and we talk about it. And uh, tonight was the author, Jana Aston, who is a, a rom-com author. And she's just, she's honestly funny. It's that kind of funny, not where you go, ha, 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 but we're like, here. she's hilarious. Um, and her books feel very theatrical. They kind of feel like a 250 page monologue where I get to take this ride um, as a performer. And that's not always the case with writing for books. Sometimes books are meant to be literary for your eyeballs only. And you can tell that the author, as wonderful a book as it may be, it was never intended to be spoken and performed. And then there's other writers, they may be thinking about the audio or they may not, but for whatever reason, their style lends itself to performance in a different way. And Jenna Aston's really do. So I love getting to work on her stuff. You know, Aaron, there's got to be um, a moment that was maybe terrifying for you or one of your scariest moments, whether it's in, in, the, in the theater, writing, acting, some, some moment that led you to go, oh, I don't know, I'm unsure of myself. Did you ever have any type of moment like that in the different creative spaces that you, you kind of live in? Um, well, early days for sure. Um, just the how do I make a living thing. Um, I always had the passion for theater, but people don't go into theater to get rich. <laughs> they don't go into theater usually to make a living. Some people are, um, some people figure it out for sure. But one thing that I feel really grateful for is figuring out somewhat early that audiobooks could take care of me, that I could be in the theater and I could be using my training as an actor every day and making a living. Um, and once I figured that out um, as an audiobook performer, my life really started to work a lot better. So I could be a performer in books and get my health insurance and I could be in plays and not worry that they were only paying me $150 a week because I knew audiobooks were taking care of me. So um, figuring that out was really important. It allowed me to stay in the business that I loved and wor not worry too much about the financial aspects. So, and I, you know, I talked to a lot of colleges um, in the spring. I tend to talk to colleges, graduating seniors about what life is like on the outside <laughs> um, once you graduate. And one thing I always talk about is that none of us escape figuring out how to make a living. And um, as artists, sometimes you're taught, don't think about money, almost like money is bad. And it's not because we certainly need it. So you can't let money drive your art by any means, but you got to figure out how to make it so you're comfortable enough to do the work that you love. On the subject of advice for uh, people getting into the field, um, last couple episodes we've done, we've had guests have spoken about just general advice that's helped them along the way, whether talking to people who are looking to enter their field or just people in the professional world. What are some other pieces of advice you'd offer to um, just people who are about to enter any space in the professional sphere? Uh, well, I'll talk about audiobook narration because it's funny. Um, if I'll go to a party or something and I'll tell people I'm a writer, they'll be interested, but only to a certain degree. I say I'm an audiobook narrator and they're like, wow, that's cool. And that's always the thing that they want to talk about, which I find interesting. Um, something that happens a lot with voice work is usually what someone will say is, oh, I've been told I have a great voice and I should get into that. And you, I never want to discourage anyone um, because yeah, it's, I'm not saying that, that saying like it's rocket science or I'm not saying that, but having a pleasant voice is a prerequisite. It's like a dancer putting on their shoes. So I have nice tap shoes is basically what you were saying when you say I have an, a nice voice then you gotta learn what to do with it. Um, so great, you have a nice voice. So what I would say is perfect. Now you have to take classes. You have to be a solid actor. You've gotta be, be believable. You have to be able to play a range of characters. Um, you have to have strong dialect and accent work, um, play a gender that's different than yours um, in a believable, not, um, not poking fun at way. 
you know? Um, and these are all tangible things that you can figure out, but it takes training. And I would also say, um, if you're interested in being an audiobook narrator, practice, and I'm not even joking, sitting and reading for four hours out loud and seeing if you find it pleasurable because it might not be for you. Um, you have to be very, very still at the microphone. You can hear the rustling of your clothes if you're wearing the wrong clothes. You can hear stomach rumbles. So you have to know what you need to eat. You could hear um, saliva in your mouth if you didn't eat the right thing, if you had too much dairy. So it's just um, a learning process. I remember when I first started, um, after my first book, I didn't know how to use my like my physical body yet. I didn't know how to use my throat and my vocal cords. And by the end of the day, I was very sore. And I could tell my voice had changed and gotten a little deeper and sore. My throat was sore. Um, and over the years, I figured out how to take care of myself. So it's a process. Um, so I'd say get training, keep your passion, and know that it's going to take a little while to find your groove. Erin, uh, tell our audience a little bit about your latest book. We, we teased it at the top, uh, Flirtosaurus. Um, it, it's been an interesting year. I'm... I've been, a, I've been a playwright for 10 years um, and I've been a narrator for 10 years. This is the first year that I've put those two worlds together um, and I wrote my first romantic comedy novel. Um, the majority, I don't think I mentioned this, the majority of what I narrate is romance. I would say about 75 to 80% of what I narrate is romance. And that's just the way it's, it's not what I set out to do, but it's just where my voice kind of is suitable and where a lot of work has come to me. Um, and I've had so much fun, particularly with romantic comedy. So I wrote my first book. It's called Flirtosaurus. It's about a paleontologist in her early 20s in Philadelphia. And she meets a, um, an astronomer who also works at the same museum that she does. Um, and it's a lot about um, being, being hard like um, emotionally hard and cut off and how to soften and let love in and let yourself move forward in the world. Um, it's all comedy forward, but there are definitely um, lessons and feels and things along the way. Yeah. And it's been a really great process. Now I'm working on book two. So it's uh, there's going to be three books in the series, it's called the Natural History Series. So the first book's Flirtosaurus, about a paleontologist. Second is called Love Bug, and she's an entomologist. She's a bug expert. And the third is going to be called Shark Bait, and she's a marine biologist. So it's three women in science um, who are actively going at their careers and figuring out love along the way. As an author, take us to your, if you don't mind, take us to your writing process. It changes all the time. I have three little kids, um, five, almost six, three, and four months old. So, um, and I'm a full-time audiobook narrator. So, and it's a pandemic <laughs> and the kids are home all the time. So I write when I can write, which is every day and often, but it's two hours during the baby's nap. Um, a half hour while the kids are playing on the floor and I got a great idea and I write it on my phone. Um, then they go to bed and at nine o'clock, then I write for three hours. Um, every day is different. But um, what some people find surprising is I don't write in order. I don't have to write scene one all the way through scene 24. Um, I'm a big believer that if if you're hearing dialogue, and I really do think in dialogue, that's something that I've had to learn this year because I do come to things as a playwright. So I'm a very dialogue-based writer. I've had to learn how to take what I think is strong dialogue and then flesh it out into a world of a novel. It's a different, there's different muscles that you need to use and that I'm learning. Um, so I'm a believer that if, if you're being spoken to by the muse, by creativity, whatever you want to call it, without being too woo-woo, you, you got to put it down. Don't shut it down. So I don't care if chapter 24 is talking to me and I'm supposed to be on chapter eight. I'm going to start writing it down. And then I'll start going in order. And when I do get to chapter 24 and I see what I wrote last week, 
I'll alter it because I've learned more about the character than I knew last week when I wrote that. Um, but I never shut it down. So anything that's coming to me, I put it down. And then it's fun because then you go back and you forget you wrote something and you see it and you're like, ah, oh, that's good. Who wrote that? <laughs> and it feels, it feels like you're in collaboration with something other than yourself. And I find that really exciting. Um, Aaron, this has been great. Um, go get Aaron's book, Flirt of Source, now. It's available uh, on Audible or wherever you get your books. Uh, like we mentioned before, she's narrated over 500, a point that she corrected me on, over 500 <laughs> books in this space. Um, so go check them out. Aaron Mallon, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, that was Aaron Mallon joining us on the show. Um, Nick, she was great. I mean, I, I, I really learned a lot about you know, her, her creativity, the, what she does in her space. I mean, you know, you talk about grind, um, you know, writing and acting in plays and then figuring out and transitioning into voice narration and now writing her own book that's out there. You know, it, it's a lot. You're putting out a lot of your work. You know, I mean, we're putting out our work in a podcast form. So uh, I truly commend her for what she's doing. And, and it's tough. It's a tough business. Yeah, I appreciate it how Aaron takes us through just the different layers. I think on the surface, I think there's some natural connections we may all draw to these different fields that she's in. But what Aaron does, I, I especially appreciate is understanding the different head spaces you have to operate from to to get into the places to to be successful in these different in, in these different arenas. Yeah. Um, thanks, everybody, again, for joining us. Um, you can check out our podcast wherever podcasts are available. If you ever want to watch the video clips, head over to YouTube. You can subscribe, follow, leave us some comments in the app stores. Um, as always, I'm Mike Leon. I'm Nick Saveri. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch everybody next time.